evening everyone i hope i am audible and uh, my screen is visible so i'm typing my chat good evening everyone i hope i am audible Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Good evening, everyone. So, thank you, everyone, for joining at this time for the next webinar. And uh, there was a little hiatus because uh, of uh, many prior commitments. Uh, so, we will be starting at six five. So, we'll just wait for another three minutes for everyone to join. In the meanwhile, in general, as the rooms. Uh, I request all of you to be at, on mute and I'll be very happy to take the queries at the end. And you can post any queries in the chat sections, in the chat section. And uh, there will be polling options. So I request all of you to uh, answer in the poll. And uh, the recording will be available on my YouTube channel. So you can uh, subscribe to the channel. So, uh, and I have, and, uh, I have tried to make a slide that Full proof, but as a human, if there are any errors, please do excuse and correct me. Another two minutes, we will join. We will be starting. <laughs> Actually, as a matter of fact, in the Rajasthan, there is uh, the net has been uh, cut from all because of the ongoing examination. So, this is a practice in Rajasthan that. Uh, whenever there are some public exams, there will be internet connection which is available. So this is through the hospital Wi-Fi. I am trying to do the webinar. So if there are any issues with the net, kindly excuse me. And uh, please join uh, this app, VWOX. So you can just type vwork.app uh, or you can just scan the QR code. So once you enter, uh, you just have to uh, type in the ID in the vwork.app. If you just enter the QR code, uh, I mean, if you just scan the QR code, you will enter the uh, MCQ so, or the polling option. And as and when the question appears on the screen, you will get it on your mobile as well. So you will have to type in or the uh, select the option on your mobile. So immediately now there won't be any question. You will just receive a blank screen with Enterococcus syndrome or the title of the webinar. So I hope all of you will utilize this so that we will have some sort of interaction. So I hope all of you have joined. So even if you have not joined, uh, as and when we project the question, there is a, the ID will always be visible on top. So you can uh, anytime use that ID to enter into the polling. So with that, let's get started. And as usual, we will start with a case. 
so this is a real case scenario which we encountered in the last few months so a patient 40 year old female with history of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia pulmonary av malformation and recurrent cva and uh, uh, non serotic portal fibrosis and history of itp so a lot of comorbidities he, he came to us with history of high grade fever which was continuous along with chills and rigors on examination he was febrile conscious oriented and the vitals were stable there was uh, a clubbing present anosis present on cvf examination there was a pan systolic murmur in the mitral area and uh, suspecting an infective endocarditis blood cultures were sent and blood culture showed enterococcus fecalis and 2d echo revealed the vegetation measuring 9 into 7 mm uh, which was only andromedal uh, leaflet so before the susceptibility was available the patient was initiated on ampicillin plus gentamicin then shifted to vancomycin plus gentamicin and then serial monitoring of vegetation was done because the patient had high grade fever spikes despite the antibiotic and the vegetation was increasing in size and even the repeat blood cultures were showing the same epicalis and it was a sensitive strain sensitive mesolytic vancomycin picoplanin uh later she developed aki uh for which she was shifted to daptomycin based combination with ampicillin and then uh, shifted chain four to ceftriaxone with daptomycin ctvs reference was done for early, early surgical intervention for which the it was advised to have a conservative management so why am i discussing this case so obviously this is a a uh, very challenging case so enterococcus in blood or enterococcal in infective endocarditis just like staph is very challenging to treat so this case is like a summary of what all i'll be uh, talking about today so first is when to suspect enterococcus infections then uh, in case of enterococcal bacteremia how to approach a case of enterococcal bacteremia or infective endocarditis what is the role of combination therapy and what combination therapy should you give and what is the role of uh, daptomycin what when should we shift the patient on daptomycin etc currently the serially the blood cultures were sterile but still the patient is in our follow up even now and the patient continues to have fever spikes and uh, the surgery has not yet been performed so this brings us to the topic the enigma of enterococcus infections uh so this will be outline first i'll be discussing the basics of enterococcal infections when to suspect enterococcal infection interpretation of uh, cultures and different infection syndromes the management of those as well as the controversial areas in, in uh, enterococcal infections and the role of combination therapy and obviously we'll have to i'll be touching upon the various persistent enterococcal infections relapses and i'll just touch upon the where we are vancomycin resistant enterococcus so starting with the basics so enterococcus was derived from the french word enterococ meaning cocci of intestinal origin that is enteric origin and initially they were grouped under streptococci under group b and uh, uh, it has been present or recognized since more than 100 years now and these are gram positive facultatively anaerobic in uh, bacteria and they are oval in shape and can be seen as single or pairs at short chain and they are capable of growing in media containing nacl 6.5% nacl can tolerate high temperatures from ranging from 10 to 45 degrees celsius and can hydrolyze equilin in presence of bile salts and when we look at the enterococcal species this list is quite long and uh, here what i have put up is the enterococcal infections which are clinically significant so all these species have been proven to be clinically significant of which the majority is formed by your enterococcus fecalis as well as the pcm so apart from that why have i highlighted galenism caseli flavenses uh, uh these are the exceptions or the separate these are the motile enterococci as we all know enterococci are non motile and uh, these are uh, intrinsically resistant to your vancomycin 
So, for coming to the colonization and virulence pattern, uh, enterococci are normal commensals of the gastrointestinal tract and they can dominate the gut microbiota of hospitalized patients who are receiving broad spectrum antibiotics. And uh, what are the infections? Usually, they cause nosocomial infection, especially in patients who are critically ill or immunocompromised. And it is one of the common organisms associated with infective endocarditis, both community acquired as well as hospital acquired. And uh, this is one of the organisms which has a role. So, infection control measures, the effect, efficiency of infective uh, infection control measures can be determined by the uh, rates of VRE. Resistance, this is just a brief overview. So, they can, uh, they usually have a very low uh, intrinsic level uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, so, especially fecium, as we all know, tends to have higher resistance compared to your callus and uh, intrinsically resistant to your aminoglycoside because of the lack of permeability into the cell wall. And uh, when you look at the other beta lactams, uh, other than penicillin or ampicillin, there is low affinity and, and they are very low battery sided. And as I mentioned, intrinsic resistance to vancomycin is there in case of tessellic flavors and gallinary. So when you look at the prevalence, so this was an uh, article which was uh, published in Infection and Drug Resistance, Global Prevalence of Antibiotic Resistance in Fetalis and Fecium. So this was a map of prevalence of VR, uh, uh, VRE fecalis. So if you look at Indian setup, so it's, it is showing the relatively uh, mid-level resistance, 5 to 10 percent resistance to your uh, van, uh, vancomycin and this was a this is the trend of vancomycin resistance in e callus in general it is uh, in the south uh, south asian countries um, southeast asian countries it is uh, plus minus it's uh, in general on a uh, lower trend next when we look at the same in the enterococcus fecium the vancomycin resistance in southeast asian countries is on the rise and uh, the prevalence of uh, vancomycin resistance of VRE again is around uh, 5 to 10 percent, and uh, which may be a gross lower estimation. Uh, so, when you look at the Indian data, so uh, this was the annual report of uh, antimicrobial resistance surveillance network came uh, report, which was between uh, for the year 2021. So, if you look at the sensitivity or the susceptibility profile. E. fecium uh, has a lower susceptibility in, uh, to ampicillin. Uh, then uh, there is a relatively higher prevalence of your high level gentamicin or aminoglycoside HLA resistance. Uh, then, when compared to that of your E. fecalis, uh, E. fecalis uh, has a general higher susceptibility to ampicillin. But when you look at the vancomycin, obviously E. fecium has a Relatively lower susceptibility, 74% compared to your uh, PCALIS, 96%. Uh, good news is linezolid remains to be overall uh, highly susceptible, around 99 to 100%. Uh, again, when you look at different tissues, again, it is, uh, it is more or less similar. Uh, one in urine isolates, the ampicillin uh, susceptibility in again PCM and PCALIS, though, uh, is quite low compared to that of your other drugs. So why is this important? You, uh, even though there is higher resistance, can you still give ampicillin? We will be discussing later. And uh, this is the trend of vancomycin. Um, or the, in general, the trend of the antibiotic susceptibility for your e fecium samples uh, between uh, 2016 to 21. In general, there is uh, no significant rise in any of them even in the intrococcus fecalis. Uh, there are also data about the VRE. So VRE is uh, general lower in case of uh, uh, fecalis, around uh, 77 isolates when compared to that of the fecium, around 130, almost double. And uh, VAN is the predominant one. There were no other genes which were seen in the Indian isolates. So coming to the interpretation of cultures, I am sure this is very 
simple for most of you so it is important that you report the species because as i mentioned before the species will determine uh, the type of susceptibility you will be expecting in general pcm tends to be more resistant to your uh, usual beta lactam like your ampicillin your penicillin ampicillin etc as well as higher percentage of vancomycin resistance and also as i mentioned there are certain species which are intrinsically resistant and also the difference in the clinical presentation wise uh, again fecalis is in general uh, more associated with genital urinary tract abnormalities whereas e cesium is more of a gi uh, uh, related pathogen and uh, they are associated with polymicrobial bacteremia and most most often seen when the patient is on previous broad spectrum antibiotics and in general carry a poorer outcomes so coming to the identification of the endococcus i am sure all of you must be doing so this is a typical pin point uh, colony that is uh, with gamma hemolysis which you will be appreciating so on gram thin you will be seeing the gram positive cocci in short pairs and short chains and uh, catalase will be the negative so uh, you will have to Uh, then bilis other tests which you can do is bilis clean test as well as growth in 6.5 percent NaCl. Usual uh, procedure is they put up arabinos uh, test. So E fecium will ferment arabinos, whereas E fecalis is will not ferment the arabinos, which can be used as a uh, easy biochemical for differentiating between E fecalis and fecium. And uh, in general, now most of you guys may be having this malditox. Or vitex, which will be further speciating it. Uh, it is not necessary. You, it is necessary that you report the species and not just stop at endococcus species, uh, and uh, not just restrict yourself to the fecalis or fecium because other species are also on the rise. So susceptibility again, uh, in general, it is tested for ampicillin, penicillin, vancomycin, and in VRE, linozole, taptomycin. So what is the important thing here is If the isolate is susceptible to penicillin, it will predict, or you can extrapolate this susceptibility to ampicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, amoxiclav, pipetaz in non-beta lactamase producing enterococci. So, in general, we don't look at beta lactamase production in enterococci, but there have been studies, uh, studies which are showing that there are higher Uh, rates of beta lactamase production even in enterococci, even though ampicillin or is coming as susceptible. So if the uh, if the patient is not responding, though the uh, isolate may be sensitive to ampicillin, we will always have to look for this beta lactamase. And one more important thing is, if the isolate is susceptible to ampicillin, you can again inter uh, uh, further interpret or extrapolate it to. The other beta lactams, just like penicillin, but it does not mean vice versa. That is, if the isolate is susceptible to ampicillin, it doesn't mean that it will be susceptible to penicillin. So it is a one-way uh, relation. And uh, this beta lactamase testing can be done with the nitrosephine disc, if whenever it is clinically relevant. So another important thing is daptomycin. If you are testing the daptomycin, there is Different breakpoint for different species. That is, E. fecium has a separate breakpoint. So, why has this been done? Basically, they have seen that uh, E. fecium, uh, in general, requires a higher dose of the PKPD parameters are such that there is no sensitive breakpoint. Instead, there is only SPD as well as resistant breakpoint which is available. And uh, Though the daptomycin is not FDA approved for the E. fecium infection, and uh, whenever the patient is on daptomycin, we'll have to evaluate for the uh, myopathy. Next important testing was the susceptibility test, which you, in when you whenever one thinks of endococcus is your HLA-R or high level aminoglycoside resistance. So, what is HLA-R? So, it is not the gen, uh, normal gentamicin or Um, uh, it's not the normal gentamicin or the uh, streptomycin normal concentration you are testing. It is a high dose. That is, 
uh, you are using very high dose of two uh, two thousand mg per liter and five hundred mg per liter for streptomycin and gentamicin, and uh, you can do with the as a disc diffusion with the high concentrated high, uh, high level uh, gentamicin or streptomycin, or you can do as a agar dilution as or as well as a um, MICE strip. The most commonly done one is the disc diffusion, and uh, one important thing to note is. high hlar does not mean you should use high dose of amino glycoside so why are you testing for high level or high dose uh, high uh, dose of amino glycoside in enterococcus as i mentioned before enterococci are intrinsically resistant to that of your to the amino glycoside why is it because of the permeability issue so that is why h amino glycosides are never used for Treatment per se in the treatment of enterococcus, but when you combine it with a beta lactam, so what is the beta lactam? What are those antibiotics? Beta lactam antibiotics are cell wall acting antibiotics, so they will uh, uh, cause the lysis of the cell wall, and hence this amino glycoside can now enter. So as a part of a synergy test or the use of, to use it as a synergistic uh, uh, antibiotic, we are doing this HLAI. And never report the normal amino glycoside for the enterococci. It should always be HLA. And it's not that in all the infections or wherever enterococcus is isolated, you should be reporting HLA. Actually, this is basically for determining whether your beta lactam will be synergistic or not. So, the places where we'll be using the combination only in such situation you should be using. Not like you, uh, urine isolate. You are isolating enterococcus, and you report HLA. There is actually no, no significance. So it is better you restrict to that of your bacteremia or the blood sample because it is usually used in treatment of your endocarditis, meningitis, etc. And uh, if it is HLA sensitive, that is, um, uh, the zone is more than ten mm, then you will use the usual dose of amino glycoside in combination with beta lactam. If it is HLA resistant, do not use the amino glycoside. So there is alternative therapy you will have to use. So this is the important table. So beta lactam, if it is sensitive, and HLA is sensitive, that is, it is uh, zone sizes more than ten mm. Ten ten mm. What is the treatment of choice? Beta lactam plus the amino glycoside. Next important thing I have given is the beta lactamase product producer. So as I mentioned. Some of the isolates of enterococcus they will increase beta lactamase produce uh, uh, beta lactamase pro uh, production. So in that situation, you use a BL BLA amphisulfatum plus amino glycoside, which can be used. Suppose there is low level resistance, that is, the MIC of the penicillin is between sixteen to sixty four, our ampicillin between sixteen to thirty two, and the H uh, HL uh, amino uh, HLAR is sensitive, that is, zone is More than ten mm, you can still use high dose beta lactam plus the amino glycoside. If beta lactam is sensitive but HLA is resistant, that is the zone is six mm, then you can't use with amino glycoside. So the alternative therapy which you use in that scenario is the beta lactam is sensitive, so you can still use beta lactam. So that is this is one of the indication for double beta lactam is uh, the double beta lactam. That is ceftriaxone plus ampicillin. Next, if the beta high level beta, I mean beta lactam has high level resistance. That is, the MICs are much more than what is I had mentioned before. But synergy or the amino glycoside is sensitive. Will you use the beta lactam instead of the beta lactam? Another cell wall active agent like your glycopeptide or daptomycin can be used. So the concept is same. So these are cell wall acting. So the cell wall. And it will allow the penetration of the amino glycoside. So suppose both are resistant. So obviously, you will not be using both. In that case, you will have to look uh, look at other uh, therapy which can be available. High dose daptomycin or daptomycin based combination therapy can be used. So next important thing for when to suspect enterococcal infection. So. Before to understand when to suspect, you need to understand how will the enterococcus causing an infection. So if you understand the how, you can easily get the what and when.
so any patient on broad spectrum antibiotics what is going to happen there is down regulation of the antimicrobial peptides which are produced in the gi this leads to increased growth of the enterococci and this is further aggravated by the use of ppis so this what is the ppi doing there is uh, causing increase in ph and as i have mentioned before enterococci can grow even in high ph so this will promote the growth of the enterococci and uh, once uh, there is a breach from the gi it is usually the source is the gi from there it disseminates via blood to it can seed into the heart valves causing infective endocarditis it can uh, uh, seed in um, or it can enter into your uh, uh, devices which are attached like catheter leading to catheter associated infection it can uh, through the hematogenous spread can involve the uh, cross the blood brain barrier causing meningitis and uh, the gre uh, the enterococcal which is excreted uh, through the feces is the reason for the environmental contamination and further spread of the infection so when to suspect a patient in sepsis or general worsening condition with advanced age or hospitalization or uh, if the patient is immunosuppressed uh, we can suspect along with the patient being on broad spectrum antibiotics any history of colonization or prior infection certain comorbidities like especially related to the that of your urogenital or the intra abdominal organs any sort of recent surgery to the urinary tract or the gi surgeries like your perforations etc or if the patient is having intravascular device so not that uh, any patient with intravascular device i will think of enterococcus so along with that if the patient is in severe sepsis and as well as uh, he has a long history of hospitalization and broad spectrum so this is a bundle in which you will be suspecting or higher suspicion for enterococcus can be there <coughs> next coming to the different infection syndromes it can cause so it can the most common uh, infection is your bacteremias and your vascular uh, or your catheter associated or device associated infections endocarditis it is one of the most uh, common cause of your uh, uh, nosocomial as well as community acquired infective endocarditis utis abdominal and pelvic infection skin and soft tissue infection it can even uh, and rare infections are that of your bone and joint cns infection that is a meningitis usually it is secondary to any device in c2 such as um, shunt infection or it is due to the extensive bacteremia the patient may be having lung infections are very very rare so uh, always you will have to whenever the enterococcus is isolated from either urine or the uh, bowel sample or the sputum you should always take it with a pinch of salt you will always have to rule out be it being a colonizer so that brings us to the case a 64 year male known case of diabetes mellitus and uh, recently he had a uh, acute coronary syndrome for which he underwent cabt uh, now he has presented to us with left atria infarct with global atresia basically we got a reference for because the patient is having progressive leukocytosis there is no fever there is no cbc there is no uh, uh, but there is a folate catheter in c2 so what would you like to do the patient they have sent a urine culture which is showing e fecalis and this is the sensitivity which is available to you so if you can see it is in intermediate to ampicillin uh, sensitive to your vanco tico cipro ligo etc so and at this point i would like all of you to use the polling so answer so what would you like to give in this patient will you give vancomycin ampicillin minocycline or you will not treat
Seeing very few responses. Uh, poor do not read colonizer. Okay. Let's end it here. So Removal of protector. So most of you have got it right. So in generally, uh, in, when you look at the patient, the patient is clinically stable. There is catheter in place, and uh, that could have been the reason, and it could have colonized it. Uh, so you will have to not treat it. Just the removal of the catheter will be treating this patient. And uh, uh, so, if at all it is indicated. You don't have to bear. You can easily get away with monotherapy. And as I mentioned before, it was intermediate to ampicillin. One important thing to note here is ampicillin achieved a very good level, almost thousand times uh, above the MIC, uh, even though it is resistant. So you can still use ampicillin to treat enterococcal uh, UTI, catheter-associated UTI as well, and. Um, this ampicillin can be used even if the uh, the isolate is a VRE. And uh, definitely not vancomycin. Minocycline, thank you, no, none of you. Say, uh, so it's a UTI, you can't use minocycline. Next case, a 47-year male, chronic alcoholic, uh, come, has come to us with severe necrotizing pancreatitis with sepsis. He has underwent multiple drainage and uh, he has multiple seeds. Fever spikes since five days now. On examination, patient is drowsy, disoriented. Left abdominal pleural drain is there, along with folate catheter. Uh, a febrile, deep is uh, 110 by 70. Per abdomen, distended and tense. He has received meropenem from past 15 days. CT scan shows bulky edematous pancreas, that is but less than 30% necrosis with multiple pancreatic collection with extension and loculated ascites. Blood culture and the drain cultures were sent and blood culture shows growth of clepsial pneumonia. Drain side shows growth of enterococcus fecalis. So this is the sensitivity report. So I request all of you to have a look at this. So we will go to the polling in the next slide. So, enterococcus fecalis, sensitive to vanco, tico, mino, tiki, linozolid. Klebsiella, again, <coughs> what type of klebsiella is it? It is a CRE. And more like, most likely to be a non MDL to do it. And uh, so what would you like to do in this? Treat only klebsiella because it is the one which is coming from blood. Treat only enterococcus. Or treat both and don't treat both because both are colonizers. So let's, I hope all of you will join the poll. Are you guys not able to use the polling option because I see very few people responding in the poll? Take only capsula, three four. Okay, it's a mixed response. So let's have a look at it. So what are the risk factors for enterococcus infection in this patient? Is it there? So the patient has GI source. There is a peripancreatic collection and extension. Patient has been on neuropenem. Does it have cover for enterococcus? So if you have attended my cardiopenem uh, webinar, I would have mentioned there is no enterococcal coverage in the treatment. And the patient is in severe uh, sepsis. Brain site is showing growth of enterococcus. 
whereas blood is showing klebsial so whenever you are looking at intra abdominal infection it has been uh, said by many two studies that intra abdominal isolation of enterococcus from the abdominal sample is associated with increased rate of post operative infectious complication higher number of treatment failure as well as increased mortality rate and if the patient is uh, having the risk factors such as if patient is severely ill as in our case or immunocompromised or if the patient is having any factors which is predisposing him to endocarditis it must be treated so this is a case of uh, so why what do you think could be the reason that uh, enterococcus has not come in the blood again i am not i am not telling that this enterococcus could not have been a colonizer it could as well have been a colonizer but looking at the patient's risk factors and the current status of the patient it is i it is better to treat both so if that, uh, this is a cre klebsiella with enterococcus so okay, can you anyone name any one anti you can give a single antibiotic which will cover both so anyone would like to take the question yeah so i've got so pt cycline so pt cycline is the one which can cover both as well as it has anaerobic co coverage which is required for the intra abdominal infection so it can be treated with pt cycline and some of you may say pt cycline has not been reported if you were concentrating enough so go back and get the ask for the susceptibility of pt cycline and uh, in general whenever you are giving empiric coverage for the intra abdominal infection it is not necessary that you cover enterococcus uh, because uh, community acquired in abdominal infection enterococcus coverage is not necessary and uh, next important thing is the meningitis it is very mm -hmm. rare in normal adult and uh, it can be uh, it can occur in presence of risk factors such as head trauma neurosurgery or intraventricular or intratecal catheters and uh, usually it is a complication of very high level of bacteremia in the patient and there has been some association like that of e coli sepsis with strongyloidus hyperinfection there has been some association with strongyloidus hyperinfection with that of the enterococcal meningitis in meningitis combination therapy is warranted so this is summarizing the uh, three syndromes or the three infective syndromes which we discussed so uti if it is susceptible strain you can treat with amoxicillin ampicillin nitrofurantoin internal phosphomycin depending upon the type of infection so if it is just a cystitis you can give nitrofurantoin if it is pyelonephritis obviously you can't use nitrofurantoin or phosphomycin and then if it is resistant to penicillin or ampicillin uh before jumping to the vancomycin or ticoplanin you can always look at the susceptibility to ampicillin okay so if it is resistant you will go for vanco or tico vanco resistant vre you will look at the susceptibility to ampicillin ampicillin can be still used because the urinary uh, levels it achieves is much higher than the mic intra abdominal infection based on the susceptibility monotherapy is recommended meningitis uh, along with aminoglycoside combination therapy can be given based on the sensitivity like if it is sensitive to ampicillin you give penicillin or ampicillin with aminoglycoside or if it is resistant you will go for vancomycin if it is vre uh, linezolid or daptomycin but note here is daptomycin has a relatively poor penetration into the cns as well as linezolid is general not preferred for the treatment of cns infection so next antibiotic therapy can you name some antibiotics which are active against enterococcus we have discussed most of it by now ampicillin yes any more vancomycin yes so this is a table which i have tried to summarize the so there is a difference so one thing is active against another thing is the treatment of choice both can be different so the treatment of choice or which is very active or uh, uh, in case of enterococcus is put in green so penicillin ampicillin amoxicillin amoxiclam or ampicillin can be used 
and uh, pipetas has a good cover against enterococcus whereas those which in case of vre obviously none of these drugs are going to be very efficient especially alone uh, ertapenem and meropenem as i mentioned before also there is no enterococcal coverage imipenem in uh, has some coverage and that is why if the patient intra abdominal infection the patient is relatively sick you always prefer imipenem over that of your meropenem or ertapenem uh, ciprolivonor has plus minus Yeah, uh, 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 cover against your enterococcus. Uh, when you look at the other beta lactam, especially your cephalosporins, most of them are not active. Ceftriaxone is the one, only one which is being used, especially that only in combination. Ceftriaxone has some cover in and as enterococcus fecalis, but no action on VRE. Amino glycoside, when you look at it, only in combination it should be given. Macrolides, no cover. Then. when you look at your uh, tetracyclines it has some so these are not the treatment of choice but if this has good uh, some cover against your fecalis as well as can be used in uh, vre daptomycin is the one which is effective against your vre vanco tico obviously the drug of choice especially if the patient is less, uh, allergic to penicillin or uh, if it is resistant to penicillin or ampicillin linezolid is the drug of choice especially in vre Nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin are good against your uh, uh, against your fecalis. And uh, quinpristone, dalfamestrin, I forgot to uh, uh, inform in this initial. So it is intrinsically resistant against fecalis, but can be used against your fecium. One newer antibiotic which is being used or uh, is coming up. This was a this is levonorgestrel. and this is an antibiotic developed in in india and it has got dcpi approval it belongs to the benzo uh, quinolizines and it inhibits so just like it, it is a oxaluquinolone analog so it will inhibit your uh, dna gyrase in addition to topom isomerase and uh, actually it has been approved for staph aureus that is mrsa and one good thing about this drug is it has both iv as well as the oral analog and does not require any renal or hepatic dose modification this is not the drug of choice i am telling it is just a upcoming drug which can be used in the vre infections next uh, whenever you are going to treat enterococcal infection you should always look at the clinical significance and just mere isolation of enterococcus doesn't mean infection uh, and does not warranty a targeted therapy it can be colonizers especially in case of respiratory specimen or urinary catheter it can be a part of mixed infection especially in case of intra abdominal surgery so every time you you are going to treat or going to treat uh, look at enterococcal infection treatment you will have to look at the site and the severity and uh, again, this have been repeated so based on the species treatment can vary so next Next case I have is a 63 year old man admitted with one month history of fever, not responding to oral levoflux which has been prescribed, and uh, there is history of uh, prostatic valve, and on examination there is leukocytosis as well as high CRP. So obviously first thing which comes to your mind a patient having prostatic valve along with having such a long history of fever. is your infective endocarditis blood cultures were sent and it is showing enterococcus fecalis with the susceptibilities as shown so what are you going to use in treatment so if you see it is sensitive to ampicillin uh vancomycin ticoplanin hlar resistant so how will you treat this infection and the poll yes
Ampicillin, combination therapy, combination, yes. So whenever we are dealing with bacteremia endocarditis, there are certain clinical dilemmas. Which antibiotic regimen to start? Is monotherapy enough in, uh, in, uh, uh, in few cases like initial therapy? Should all the patient undergo echocardiography? And if uh, echocardiography is needed, in which patient trans thoracic examination uh, is sufficient? In which patient should undergo trans esophageal echocardiography? Uh, these, these are the clinical dilemmas. It's not necessary that uh, any, every patient with just endococcal bacteremia you give the combination therapy, you should always gauge. Uh, so, whenever you look at the bacteremia, the PCALIS has a higher uh, rate of case fatality between 10 to 20%. And the usual portal of entry of your endococcus in the blood is your, your catheters, uh, localized endococcal infection, and your intestinal translocation. So, whenever you are dealing with your thinking of endococcus bacteremia, you will have to look at the risk factors or uh, as I mentioned before, the patient in sepsis, nosocomial acquisition, having the broad spectrum antibiotics. You will have to do the physical examination, identify the source, whether it is catheter, is there any indwelling line, is there any murmurs, any surgery she has undergone and do the appropriate imaging, identify the species as well as ASC and echocardiography to be done if the risk factors are present. So, uh, determination of source is very important because the therapy you're going to give will depend if your the source is identifiable or not. So if the foca is primary, that is, there is no source, you know, it is necessary uh, to uh, uh, do the 2D echo as well as give the combination therapy and the treat for up to two to six weeks based on the presence of infective endocarditis. If it is just endo, uh, uh, bacteremia secondary to the endovascular devices, source control, that is the removal of the catheter is necessary. And uh, local USG, uh, the venous Doppler can be done. Monotherapy will suffice in that case, in, in such scenarios. If the source or the foci is secondary to the abdominal tract, uh, the risk of IE is quite low. So the echo is uh, not necessary in all the patients. Abdominal imaging as well as source control is required. And it's not necessary that you treat endococcus infection per se. So most of uh, most often what we what I have seen is every organism add one antibiotic. So if it is uh, so one antibiotic for endococcus, one antibiotic for uh, your uh, uh, E. coli, one antibiotic for if there is some candida which is isolated. Always try to look at the spectrum of the antibiotic and try to uh, choose the antibiotic which achieves good concentration at the site as well as uh, has coverage for multiple organisms. Next, genitourinary tract, the risk of IE is quite low. So there is no recommendation for two wing to the echo. Remove the catheter, obviously. And if it is clinically indicated, therapy with uh, monotherapy and always to rule out pyelonephritis by doing the US. Skin and soft tissue infection, Endococcal skin and soft tissue infection are quite uh, low. And again, obviously, the IE risk is very low. And uh, source control, that is the debridement should be done. Monotherapy for around one to two weeks is recommended. So if there is no suspicion of complicated endobacterial infection or endococcal bacteremia, mono monotherapy will suffice. Uh, the choice of uh, antibiotic will depend again on the susceptibility, sensitive to ampicillin or susceptible to ampicillin, go for it. If there is history of beta lactam allergy, you can shift to vancomycin or daptomycin or inazolid. Complicated bacteremia, combined therapy and higher doses are preferred. If infective endocarditis is confirmed, ampicillin plus ceftriaxone or ampicillin plus gentamicin, depending upon the synergy test. And uh, in that, uh, if you are giving gentamicin, the dose of uh, the duration for gentamicin is usually 7 to 14 days. You need to give for the entire 6 weeks you are going to treat. And if it is VRE, you have to give, uh, you should document the clearance and 14 days after the clearance, you should be giving the treatment. So bacteremia, sensitive to ampi or uh, penicillin, treat with ampicillin or penicillin. Resistant to those, vancotico will become your second option. Uh, if it is VRE, again, always look at the ampicillin susceptibility. It's not like uh, uh, 
uh, staff that it is uh, uh, one or the one antibiotic resistant means resistant to all the beta lactams. So uh, if it can be a VRE, but still susceptible to ampicillin, especially in case of your P. callus. Uh, if it is resistant to ampicillin, also go for linezolid or daptomycin. Endocarditis again, uh, as this uh, part we have already discussed. Uh, HLAR positive, what you will give if it is beta lactamase producer, what you will give. As this has already been discussed. One important thing to note is that HLAR or the synergy which you are expecting between a beta lactam and aminoglycoside is for your E. callus only, not for your E. fecium. E. fecium, there is no synergy which is demonstrable. So whenever it is E. fecium, uh, you will be testing. Usually the ampicillin MICs are going to be quite high. In that case, there is no synergy, but still high dose ampicillin plus aminoglycoside can be tried. If it is HLAR, uh, and M M M M M MIC is less, you can give high dose ampicillin plus DAPTO or quinopristine, darcopristine plus high dose ampicillin. If it is uh, ampicillin resistant, HLAR, obviously you have to go for alternative therapy, high dose daptomycin plus amino glycoside or uh, linezolid combination with another agent. So, I've discussed so many. So why not treat all the patients of enterococcus with a glycopeptide? So obviously the ampicillin, uh, penicillin, why should we treat with those when we can treat as well with uh, vancomycin even those cases? So this has been studied. So this is a paper, clinical impact of vancomycin treatment in ampicillin susceptible enterococcal bacteremia infection. Here they have observed that whenever the patient was uh, treated uh, with vancomycin, even though the isolate was ampicillin susceptible, there was higher odds ratio of 4.5. Higher mortality was seen. Even if they were given uh, beta lactam, you can even give beta lactam combination instead of vancomycin if the patient is having ampicillin susceptible. So the odds ratio, the risk of mortality is higher if you give vancomycin instead of giving the beta lactam, which is uh, susceptible. So just like your staph aureus, it has been there even in case of your enterococcus. So this is the kaplan mayer of survival. So lower survival was seen with that of your vancomycin and this is a clinically significant um, uh, difference. Another paper, glycopeptide use is associated with increased mortality in E. C. callus bacteremia. Here also they have observed that Giving glycopeptide was associated with lower survival when compared to that of your beta lactam. And the uh, risk, uh, they have looked at the various other uh, factors which could be uh, contributing to that. In that, uh, if you see uh, the comorbidities, existence of malignancy was one. Another thing is the glycopeptide, glycopeptide therapy. So, blanket therapy of glycopeptide should be avoided in a patient. We are having enterococcus bacteremia having susceptibility to the ampicillin. So echocardiography, uh, infective endocarditis. So bacteremias are more severe with that of the callus, but uh, as well as infective endocarditis is far more common in that of your P. callus than that of your fecium. So when to do the echo? It must always be performed if there is E. P. callus along in the blood, along with stroke related bacteremia, as well as lapse of the bacteremia. That is a patient in stroke, you don't expect fever. If the patient with stroke is having fever and the blood is growing enterococcus, always have to suspect endocarditis. And depending upon the presence or absence of risk factors, that is uh, more than two positive blood cultures with E. P. callus, prosthetic heart valve, unknown source of infection, community acquired infection, if there are murmurs and duration of symptom, that is uh, the patient is having fever, uh, bacteremia for more than one week, if two or more or the risk factor is present, always echocardiography should be done. And this is for E. C. callus bacteremia. So we have a de novo score, just like that of your Wittstadt score for your staph aureus. We have a de novo score for that of your uh, enterococcus. It uses six criteria, cutoff of if it is less than three, it has a suggest that it is a very low risk for the enterococcal infective endocarditis uh, with a good sensitivity and specificity. 
more than equal to three warrants a echocardiography. That is B, stands for duration of symptoms more than seven. E, evidence of embolization, like um, that, like the stroke could be a manifestation of the emboli. And number of positive blood cultures, that is two or more. Unknown origin of the bacteremia, prior heart valve surgery, and auscultation of the heart murmur. So basically, the risk factors they try to make it uh, into a score so that uh, it is easy to remember. So what is the role of combination therapy? So this is a very good article which I would ask everyone to have a look at. So they have reviewed the combination therapy for epicalis bacteremia. So why, why did this combination therapy start first of all? So uh, when epicalis there was uh, uh, bacteremia, patients were treated with ampicillin. And they noticed that there was a treatment failure of up to 60% uh, in case of infective endocarditis. Hence, people started looking at the combination therapy. And so why is the combination of beta-lactam and aminoglycoside used? So uh, beta among the beta-lactams, I have, as I mentioned, very few beta-lactams have a good activity or potency against your enterococcus like your aminopencillins, uridopencillins, as well as imipenem. By, uh, this is by the inhibition of CBC. And if there is expression of beta-lactamase in there, ampicelbactam can be used. So why are we, we using other beta-lactams like your cephalosporin in enterococcal infection? Because these uh, uh, enterococcus with other beta-lactams, they are tolerant to beta-lactams. That is, the concentrations which are achieved with the use of other beta-lactams are not very high. So it, the organism will become tolerant not and not necessarily be killed by the uh, uh, other antibiotics, other beta lactams. And as I mentioned, aminoglycoside is intrinsically resistant due to the decrease in permeability. So, you, when you use a combination, the cell wall active agents like that of your beta lactam will break the cell wall as which will increase the permeability of the aminoglycoside, giving a synergistic bactericidal effect. And I have mentioned only streptomycin and gentamicin. So why are we using only these two aminoglycosides? So are these the only aminoglycosides which are available? Definitely no. But what I have seen is uh, uh, the uh, other aminoglycosides, there is cross resistance to all the other aminoglycosides except for that of your streptomycin. That is why only these two, whenever in intercocus you are using, you can use only these two aminoglycosides, not any other like that of your tobramycin. So next combination which has come up is your dual beta-lactam. Like when I said, there is no synergy, means you go for a dual beta-lactam like your ampicillin plus ceftriaxone. So why are we using this dual antibiotic? So they came up because there is increased resistance to the, or the high level aminoglycoside resistance, which range between up to 63%. So even in our Indian scenario, you have seen most of them around 30 to 50 percent of HLAR was there. So that is why dual beta lactam therapy came. And so, why are we using ampicillin and ceftriaxone? Ceftriaxone per se, or the cephalosporin per se, has a very weak activity. Hence, we are using the combination. So, what is happening when you are giving the combination? So, when we give the combination, ampicillin is inhibiting or saturating PBP145. Ceftriaxone is saturating the PBP2 and 3. That is why when you give this as a combination, there is synergistic bactericidal rather than it be, it was initially tolerant to, uh, to the ceftriaxone, but when you give it as a combination, the combination is becoming bactericidal. And this synergy is seen only against E. callus, not against that of your PCM. And one more important thing was, it is sparing the risk of nephrotoxicity. So uh, this is a review article uh, where they'll try to look at uh, the time to abandon ampli gentamicin in favor of ampli plus ceftriaxone. So most of the studies which have shown is uh, that uh, the when you look at the mortality outcome, both of them ha are having more or less equal. That is, the, both the combination has more or less equal outcome. But when you look at the nephrotoxicity, uh, uh, the studies are favoring the use of ampicillin plus ceftriaxone because of the uh, because we are not using the, an aminoglycoside, there is reduced nephrotoxicity and reduced adverse effect requiring the drug 
withdrawal. So that is why we have moved from giving the therapy with beta-lactam plus aminoglycoside to ampicillin plus ceftriaxone. So why are we now jumping to other combination like daptomycin based combination? Why? Because ceftriaxone we are giving for such a long duration. This is an independent risk factor for C. difficile infection. And this is one of the major risk factor for occurrence of VRE. So what is happening? Ceftriaxone is a antibiotic which has a biliary clearance, which has a high biliary expression. Hence, it will promote overgrowth of the ampicillin or the VRE in the gut. And these MICs of these are uh, significantly very high. So, we have, when we are giving the ceftriaxone plus ampicillin salvactam, effectively what are we doing? We are selecting out drug-resistant isolates of enterococci in the gut. And this is not just a risk to the individual patient. This is a public health emergency which is promoting the multi-drug resistant in the hospital environment. That is why now we have moved on to the daptomycin-based combination. And why are we using daptomycin plus beta-lactam? Because the activity of the daptomycin is potentiated by the beta-lactam. Why? So, what is the mechanism of action of daptomycin? Daptomycin is a calcium, uh, so calcium-based antibiotic, which is uh, acting on the cell uh, surface. So, these beta-lactam will uh, reduce the charge and uh, increase the binding of that of your daptomycin, leading to increased uptake of your daptomycin. So, uh, and also one more thing is there is a something called the seesaw effect which is observed with that of your daptomycin and your beta lactam. So, what we have seen is that whenever there is increased resistance to daptomycin, there is increased sensitivity to that of your beta lactam antibiotic. So, if, uh, even though the daptomycin resistance can emerge on the treatment, by giving this combination, we are avoiding that. So, this is a seesaw effect. So, the common combination which we use is dapto plus ampicillin, dapto plus septarolin. Uh, there is uh, uh, one a trial which has uh, used daptomycin plus gentamicin plus rifampicin. So, all of these major basically are in patients with infective endocarditis. What they have uh, surprisingly seen is uh, the renal toxicity of gentamicin was attenuated by concomitant use of that of, of your daptomycin. Last topic, I'm uh, talking about the relapses. So, uh, relapses are quite... Uh, relapses are quite common in case of... In case of your uh, uh, enterococcal infection. So, the major risk factor for the relapses uh, has been have active malignancy. When daptomycin was used in frontline therapy, infective endocarditis, which were associated having a very high uh, odds ratio of around 4, etc. And uh, in, in, in infective endocarditis, when you look at the risk factors for the relapse, so as I mentioned, there are various regimens. So you can ampicillin, ampicillin, gentamicin, ampicillin, septiaxone. So this study tried to look at which combination is the best in infective endocarditis for the treatment. So obviously, single use of ampicillin was the associated with higher incidence of relapses. When you compare the combination, the when uh, they have observed that when you give initial two weeks of ampicillin uh, plus gentamicin followed by ampicillin septiaxone, this was associated with a lower or relapse rate in infective endocarditis. So, they were suggesting uh, that you use initial two weeks you give ampicillin gentamicin followed by ampicillin septriaxone. So, this was the survival probability. In general, it was uh, equal in all the combination and lower in case of using ampicillin alone. And uh, the uh, median time of relapse most commonly was three to six months. Most of them will present to you with a fever or sepsis and uh, management surgery is the one. So, if the uh, basically patient is having infective endocarditis, if the patient is still having relapse, he has to undergo the surgery to remove the, that is a source control. So, the more common relapses was again seen with ampicillin septriaxone combination.
and uh, this is another study which they have looked at the uh, causes or the risk factors for persistent bacteremia as i mentioned infective endocarditis complicated infections were associated with a higher uh, relapse when compared to so uti had the lower lower u so as a source of infection as a lowest chance for relapses last the controversies in case of enterococcus is uh there was there is a known link between colorectal malignancy and your streptococcal infection or streptococcus gallolyticus infective endocarditis but there has been studies which is showing that there is increased so whenever the patient is having e pcm endococcus pcm uh, 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 bacteremia you will uh, uh, look for the colorectal um, neoplasm this is a study Uh, which was a preliminary result of a cohort of 154 patients, where they have uh, taken the patients with in enterococcal infective endocarditis uh, uh, and uh, looked at the source. In the patients having unknown source of infection, uh, they have seen that around 78 percent had some sort of colorectal disease, and in 78 percent, around 30 percent had some sort of evidence of colonic malignancy. that is why they are recommending that in all cases of enterococcus pcm infective endocarditis or persistent or relapsed bacteria with unclear source of infection we have to do the colonoscopy until this uh, causal relation is established the talking about the drug resistance in enterococcus um, the amino glycoside as i mentioned is due to the low uptake daptomycin due to the mutation lia f gdp d and uh, beta lactams due to the pbc altered pbc and uh, your vancomycin i'll be discussing about vre in uh, in some time now uh, so this is a just a overview of various resistance uh, due to various drugs among your tetracycline tdcycline is basically due to the efflux pump and the linezolid due to the mutation in the 23 rs rrna and uh, reduce affinity to the antibiotic is predominant cause so when you look up uh, when if you remember the first case which i discussed so what was the cause of e fecalis bacteremia that could have been due to the ev malformation which could have affected the gi tract and what was the cause of persistent bacteremia one thing the patient had infective endocarditis surgical drainage was not done next thing the patient was treated with vancomycin that is a glycopeptide instead of giving the ampicillin so vancomycin resistant very briefly i'll be just for the completion sake vre again is a very uh, large topic so i will not be going in detail but uh, it uh, won't do justice to enterococcal infections if i don't talk about the vre it is a public health emergency and uh, it is more than the treatment of vre it is the infection control and prevention of the colonization is which is the ideal management of vre and uh, we will have to prevent the colonization so uh, uh, the risk factors for vre include the patient characteristic prior antibiotic colonization pressure environmental contamination so when you look at the mechanism of vancomycin resistance in enterococci so vancomycin is a cell wall inhibitor so how is it acting so basically it is a analog of your diala diala so Uh, and it uh, instead of uh, instead of this, it will vancomycin will be binding to the diala diala and uh, inhibiting the uh, peptidoglycan synthesis by preventing both uh, uh, transpeptidation as well as trans uh, glycosylation. And so VRE. So how does the vancomycin resistance develop? Instead of diala diala. the uh, organism starts producing some other thing like diala d lactate diala d serine etc so vancomycin can no longer bind to the uh, molecule and that's why the uh, organism will multiply so again there are various uh, genes that is van gene which is uh, uh, when you if you have to look at the molecular level the resistance so this is a van a gene this is the set of the uh, Uh, set of uh, the cassette or the it has van s van r van h hacks h a x y and z each one has its own uh, function van s is the, acting as a sensor s stands for sensor van r is the response regulator so 
van yes what it will do it will sense the presence of the vancomycin gives the input to the r so what it does is a phosphorylation will happen and then uh, what uh, so uh, the this uh, purple thing is the diala diala so this is where van x x stands for is a dipeptidase so what it is doing is it is breaking up all your diala diala so diala uh, into the uh, instead of dipeptide it is making it a monopeptide next comes the action of van h which is a dehydrogenase so what it is doing the pyruvate which is synthesized as a part of the cell cycle um, is converted dehydrogenated into the uh, lactate so next comes the job of a van a which is a ligase so what is this van a is doing it is combining the monopeptide diala with d lactate that is ligating these and forming diala d lactate and hence vancomycin resistance other the other accessory genes include van y and van z van z the mechanism is not known van y is a carboxypeptidase that is uh, it is uh, uh, breaking up the um, peptidoglycan molecule which is containing the diala d lactate for ultimately resulting in formation of diala d lactate in case of your van a gene and this will result in the vancomycin resistance so high level resistance is seen with van a b b low level vancomycin resistance is seen is van c e g l and n and uh, high level resistance usually cross resistance with picoplanin is uh, there and hence it is not uh, recommended that you give van vanco or picoplanin in this case and just uh, i'm sure most of you will know vrsa developed due to the transfer of van a gene from the vre to the stat and uh, this is a representation of various gene as i mentioned so van a b b m uh so each one has its own set of uh, the cassette so it uh, uh, just like i have explained for van a similar function is uh, there for other uh, genes as well and uh, this is uh, just a summary table so van a as i mentioned it has high level resistance to vancomycin as well as picoplanin van c is expressed in case of your Uh, galinarum and casein flavor so what did i tell so that is why they are intrinsically resistant to that of your vancomycin van b uh, it is high resistance to vancomycin but susceptible to picoplanin so if it is van b expressing if uh, enterococcus you can still use picoplanin so the treatment option the only fda approved treatment option for vancomycin Uh, resistant enterococcus pcalis is linezolid pcm you can use linezolid or quinpristin dapropristin and it which is not approved but can be used is your other drugs like daptomycin uh, nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin can be used only in case of urinary infection tigecycline doxycycline minocycline fluoroquinone or rifampicin not as a single agent but in combination Other investigational agents include your ortevancin, ceftobiprol, ceftorolin. Uh, the VRE treatment options are very limited. Linezolid, what is the FA uh, or uh, linezolid is considered to be bacteriostatic, but this is the only approved FDA approved treatment for your VRE bacteremia as well. And uh, so it depends. So whenever you're looking at the treatment of VRE bacteremia, you should always look at the daptomycin MIC as well as linezolid susceptibility if it is uh, daptomycin mic is less than 2 you can the dose is uh, 10 mg per kg if it is between 2 to 4 use a higher dose of 12 mg per kg and endocarditis daptomycin is the one which is preferred linezolid should be preferentially avoided and you uh, general consider combination with the uh, beta lactam agent uh, so there were there are multiple studies which has looked at compared linezolid versus daptomycin for treatment of vre bacteremia and surprisingly they have found that uh, linezolid had uh, lesser clinical failure compared to daptomycin and lower mortality as well as microbiological failure so why when they looked at the reason for this this was due to the initial initially the user daptomycin was used at 6 mg per kg 
in the study as well it was used at 6 mg per kg so that is why it is the, the clsi as well as the ids is now recommending a higher dose of daptomycin if you are using daptomycin in therapy and there similarly there are so many studies which are evaluated compared between daptomycin and linezolid and uh, there are both types which is available uh, so to so summarizing the literature if you see if you have to give a monotherapy they had showed that improved survival with linezolid at least two out of four uh, uh, meta analysis have showed that linezolid was more effective than that of your daptomycin and again as i have showed the ret retrospective study increased the clinical failure with daptomycin and uh, the dose was quite low and whenever you are looking at daptomycin uh, as i mentioned uh, the dose was a major issue and even if you are give uh, two cohorts have demonstrated uh, there was lower mortality when you when there was use of higher doses and higher doses what is the risk the risk of uh, uh, elevation of creatinine kinase but there was no such association which was seen and when uh, the literature for combination therapy as i mentioned daptomycin and beta lactam are quite synergistic so there is a good synergistic action and that is why you can use better to use a daptomycin based or uh, beta uh, combination therapy with a beta lactam to prevent the emergence of further resistance so the uh, more than the treatment it is the prevention hand hygiene contact and barrier precautions source uh, precaution source control cohorting the patient surveillance and controlled use of antibiotics and environmental cleaning these are the important steps for the vre prevention and uh, id consultation in e fecalis bacteriemia they have uh, uh, as we showed you to have a better outcome and uh, this is a bundle they have uh, prescribed that is any cases of enterococcus bacteriemia you have to send follow up blood culture source control do the echocardiography when indicated appropriate definitive therapy and treatment according to the complexity of the infection this can be done uh, effectively if it is done under the id consultation and this uh, study impact of mortality uh, uh, when you are using such a bundle uh, was quite significant in all the aspect and this is a caplan mayer curve should demonstrating reduce mortality if we use this kind of bundle approach along with the id consultation so that brings to the end of the session uh, yeah it exceeded more than one hour so but i wanted to cover these important uh, topics so i have announcement here so as you all know the book i have uh, uh, released these chapters so i wanted to know if you guys want a youtube video on discussing these chapters and if you are interested i would like to make otherwise no uh, kindly respond so i had uh, did, i have written on empirical therapy as well as uh, treatment of gnb and gpc targeted therapy so staff and intercoccus i have covered now so other uh, gram negative gram negative infection cre or uh, dtr pseudomonas strap i have already covered in my previous webinar so the remaining streptococcus pneumoniae and a uh, few miscellaneous gram positive organisms and a uh, few infectious syndromes like brucella nocardia and Uh, I have discussed in this uh, chapter. So, okay, most of your guys are responding yes. Look, I will try to have a video, or uh, if not the webinar, at least I will try to release the webinar. And uh, further, I have certain things which I have planned. So, I want to give uh, what new in ID which I want to release as a monthly video. Uh, the chapter discussion, uh, which I have mentioned before. infectious disease syndrome so instead of concentrating on one organism syndrome wise discussion i would like to have so plan uh, and uh, case discussion and short videos on short topics i planning so for all such content don't forget to like share and subscribe to my channel 
So let me take any questions. If you guys are having any questions, anyone wants to ask? Let me check in the chat section. Hello. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello, Akshita. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm Viral. Uh, I'm from Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Okay. One question I want to ask is if uh, the uh, enterococcus is ampicillin susceptible, oh. then we can extrapolate extrapolate it to the M rest of the ampicillin, amoxicillin, amoxicillin, clavulanic, and ampicillin sulbactam. Yes. But if it it is ampicillin resistance, oh. then uh, we have to taste individual antibiotics. No, 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 no. Penicillin susceptible, it will mean penicillin sensitive, ampicillin and rest all. Ampicillin sensitive means further. From ampicillin further. Not does not mean sensitive to penicillin alone. Rest all you can extrapolate. But if it is ampicillin resistance. Okay, ampicillin resistant means uh, you, you you can't give any of those antibiotics. So we, we can uh, straight away say that it is resistance to amoxiclave, ampicil bactam yes. and amo yes. ampicillin. Yes. So no need no need to taste uh, rest of the antibiotics, ah, right? No need to taste. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, in between, I think someone else had raised their hand. I couldn't catch their name. Sorry. Doctor Akshata, can you hear me? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Navina from Bangalore, I met you in the uh, workshop. Ah, yes, sir. Yeah, this is with regard to endocarditis, the efficalis endocarditis. Mm. So one of your slides mentioned only if it's fecium, you screen, uh, you do the colonoscopy for any neoplasm. Ah, yes. But uh, when, you had, uh, when you discussed, you were also mentioning that efficalis also should be screened. So, uh, should all the... Uh, Enterococcus uh, strains in the uh, endocarditis uh, be screened for uh, color, this thing? Actually, the association is not proven yet. It was a small cohort, but it is more of fecium. Because as I mentioned initially only, uh, fecalis source is usually the extra external devices like UTI, whereas fecium, the source is the GI. So if you're seeing fecium and there is no other source you're identifying, like there is no uh, any surgery which was performed or um, uh, there is no uh, broad spectrum antibiotic, the patient has no other uh, sources like intravascular device or endocarditis, no unknown source yeah. and efficient bacteremia, always do colonoscopy. That is what has been suggested. Right now we have a patient with uh, infective endocarditis. Huh. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Ah, yes. With efficient, which is grown. Huh. It is uh, 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 it is intermediate to penicillin and uh, uh, resist high level genta resistance. So we have uh, asked them to start off with ampi and septrioxone. Okay. So all infected endocarditis is uh, four to six weeks, right? Ah huh, yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Should we periodically monitor for uh, this thing? Blood, Blood culture, culture has to be sent. I mean, we had periodically uh -huh. monitored because the patient had persistent fever spike. Ha uh ha -huh. ha. Okay. 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 Thank you, Akshata. And hello. Hello. 